like to thank everybody for coming out tonight for the public lecture. This is my fifth time at Aspen Winter Conference. I love to come here. This is the first time as an organizer. I always promised that if I could ever organize this conference, I'd retire the next week. So we'll see what happens next week. Um, yeah, it's a great place to do physics and a great place to ski and enjoy the outdoors. Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce Natalie DeLeon today. Uh, Natalie is an associate professor in electrical and computer engineering at Princeton University. Um, she did her undergrad degree at Stanford, got her PhD at Harvard. She's been doing just amazing work in quantum computing and making qubits better by thinking about materials. She has a ton of awards. Um, last year, the American Physical Society uh, awarded her with the Landauer and Bennett Quantum Computing Award, which is the only national award in quantum computing that I know of. And it's a great pleasure to have her here today. Thank you so much for the invitation to Aspen. It's my first time here. Absolutely beautiful. I went for a nice walk today. And the physics summer school or winter school has also been really fun. So um, I guess if you were intrigued by the title about how to build a better qubit, maybe you're aware that there are quite a few groups around the world and even large, large scale industry efforts uh, that are focused on uh, trying to build quantum technologies. Um, and in some ways, this is actually a quite old story. Quantum mechanics is about 100 years old now, and a lot of the technologies that really made the 20th century possible arose from our understanding of quantum mechanics. So fundamentally, quantum mechanics really tells us about the nature of matter, uh, how uh, light works, how light interacts with matter, uh, and our and this you know detailed understanding of how the world works at very small scales gave rise to, you know. Our ability to make these large-scale microprocessors that make essentially our entire lives possible today, uh, lasers like this pointer <laughs> that I'm using right now, um, and uh, and even medical technologies like magnetic resonance imaging. Okay, so people have been doing quantum engineering for a really long time. So when we talk about quantum technologies being a new enterprise of the 21st century, what are we talking about? So this is generation one. Generation two uh, is, is fundamentally different in that now what we're interested in trying to do is exploit some of the weirder fe features of quantum mechanics. So all of those uh, technologies that I showed you on the first slide really just involved understanding kind of, you know, what electrons do in all of these materials and where all of their energy levels are. Uh, but there, quantum mechanics also tells us there are other really weird things that are possible, weird things that made a lot of people uncomfortable for much of the 20th century. Uh, still make people uncomfortable today. And, you know, we only have a working understanding of a lot of these things. So uh, the first is that quantum mechanics allows uh, for, um, for things to not only exist in you know, state zero or state one, also in superpositions of these states. Uh, so this is really cool. Uh, but in addition to it being cool, this is very useful because these superposition states be, for example, highly sensitive to their environment. You could imagine turning this into a very good sensor built on the principles of quantum mechanics. Uh, the other thing that quantum mechanics allows for is that you can have two particles or two states that are entangled. And what entangled means is that when I go and try to you know, measure the states of these particles, they are now going to be correlated in a way that's really fundamental. Um, and we don't have a classical description that captures this at all. It only comes from quantum mechanics. Uh, so the question is, these these two things seem like pretty weird and abstract, uh, but maybe we can exploit uh, these two features of quantum mechanics to build fundamentally new technologies. But some people call this quantum 2.0, uh, and the kinds of areas that people are looking at are exploiting superposition entanglement, uh, and also, I didn't mention this, but measurement is a really weird concept in quantum mechanics as well, um, for doing quantum information processing, uh, like building quantum computers, which, you know, are in the news all the time. Um, there are also a lot of ideas for how you transmit quantum information over long distances and build out quantum networks. Um, and then uh, also ideas about how to exploit these weird properties of quantum mechanics to build very good uh, sensors. So let me just give you a flavor of what these three technologies are before I get into the, um, the bones of the talk. Um, so, uh, you know, why do we think we can build better computers based on these weird principles of quantum mechanics? Um, so the, the short answer, the shortest answer is that uh, very clever people like Peter Shor can come up with algorithms that exploit this entanglement and measurement and superposition 
um, that can then do things that are just impossible on classical computers. So the specific thing that uh, Peter came up with uh, is that you can factor very, very large numbers and you can factor them extremely quickly. Um, so I'm sure that everyone knows this, but like factors of 15, are three and five, that's easy to do in your head. Factors of an extremely large number, like a number that has, you know, is long on a piece of paper, uh, is extremely hard to do. And if you gave a classical computer this task, it would take age of the universe or many times the age of the universe to actually complete it. Um, it turns out that there's kind of a neat trick in some algorithms where instead of just trying to kind of plug and chug through numbers, you can set up the problem as a bunch of uh, coherent and, uh, and incoherent waves sort of interfere with each other, and then magically converge on the right answer at the end. <laughs> Sounds kind of like magic. It's kind of magic. <laughs> it's a little bit magic. So, so the picture that you should have in your head for a quantum computer is instead of little bits flipping back and forth and give you, giving you ones and zeros, instead you sort of start this uh, process where you have a bunch of waves that are propagating forward. Um, I asked PT to make a picture of this, so that's what this this rendering is. Um, all of the pictures from GPT are still in this kind of funny uncanny valley thing where they're like almost right, a little bit weird. Um, but so you have these waves propagating through your computer, and then you just set up the problem so that they constructively interfere to give you the right answer. Um, so this is, you know, fundamentally different technology from what we have now. It's not simply a computer lives, you know, on your desktop that we make gigantic and turn into a supercomputer, but it's really a completely different thing. Okay, my next example um, is quantum networks. So, uh, so, and the example is, is specifically quantum key distribution. So what I mean by that is, let's say I wanted to send uh, in a coded message to you. The simplest way that we could send coded messages to each other, that we each have just a piece of paper where we've written down the code, the substitution code, um, and I have my piece of paper and you have your identical piece of paper and nobody else has seen these pieces of paper. Uh, and then I send you a code that's you know encoded by this piece of paper. Then you go and decode it. It's really easy. That's called a one-time pad. It's perfectly secure. It's just very hard to do at scale. Right? Um, so, uh, so quantum mechanics gives you a way to send these one-time paths over very long distances in a way that is fundamentally secure. I can basically have, this is also made by GPT, I can have, uh, you know, one person sitting over here, for some reason we always call them Alice and Bob, and Alice and Bob are just communicating by sending photons over very long distances, um, and what they can do is basically change the states of these photons in a way uh, that, you know, Bob can detect, and the two of them know a few things about how you decode this thing, and then they can write down one time pad. And what quantum mechanics tells me is that if someone else tried to eavesdrop on this channel, it would fundamentally change the outcome of these measurements, so we'd be able to detect it. And quantum mechanics also tells me, um, it's actually kind of magical, this is with like three lines of math, but there's no way for anyone to intercept the message and just copy it. There's something called the no cloning principle. Um, so this is very cool because it means that I have a way of now transmitting encrypted messages uh, that are guaranteed by the fundamental laws of physics. So I don't have to rely on, you know, just some space in things being hard to, to encrypt or decrypt. Uh, but it's really, as long as quantum mechanics is right, this is right. right. The third uh, technology that's a little bit more physics-y um, is, uh, is that we can exploit certain correlations, quantum mechanics, to make much more sensitive measurements. So uh, LIGO, which was in the news quite a bit over the last few years, is this, uh, is this giant observatory uh, for things like, and I know absolutely nothing about this topic of the cosmology side, uh, but if you have things like uh, black holes that are spinning around each other and colliding, then they emit gravity waves. And for a very long time, it was science fiction to actually detect these gravity waves. The way that uh, some um, really incredibly incredible scientific team has, uh, has built to detect these gravity waves is that they have a giant interferometer. So they uh, they have some mirrors and they send lasers in. Then what they're trying to do is detect uh, in a very, very precise way differences in the path lengths of these two arms, because that's related to these gravity waves kind of traveling through your interferometer. Um, and this is, I hope someone writes a book about this project someday, because it's just like absolutely incredible what they were able to achieve. So what they did was they maxed out the precision classically 
uh, of everything they could possibly do here. I mean, just it's, it's this amazing engineering challenge to, uh, you know, to build these mirrors, stabilize them, uh, put in all of this light and uh, measure this with extreme precision to get that last mile uh, to be able to detect the number of events that they can detect now, they had to do something called squeezing. This is uh, another weird thing from quantum mechanics where you can basically have weird correlations uh, in light sources that are allowed by quantum mechanics and then give you another boost in precision by, I don't know, a factor of two or something. Um, okay, so you can build better sensors uh, also through the magic of these two principles of quantum mechanics. So now I have to, now that we've set up that there are some beautiful technologies out there, I have to give you some context about what a qubit is. Um, so a classical bit, um, I'm sorry for the heavy reliance on GPT here. <laughs> I am a very bad artist. So this is better than what I would have done. Um, uh, okay, so a classical bit is basically just a little switch in your computer that can switch between zero and one. And um, all of these little zeros and ones are just the basis of all of the information, uh, you know, that you interact with every day, like the videos that you um, send to your family of grandkids and stuff. <laughs> so, uh, so that's what a classical bit is. A quantum bit, very similar. Um, you have some state that's a zero and some state that's a one. The weirdness of quantum mechanics now allows me to also have superpositions of the zero and one. Uh, and um, and that sounds very mysterious, so let me try to demystify it just a tiny bit. Uh, so there's a nice physical picture that if you imagine, probably a bad idea with this microphone in this configuration, but I'm going to try it. <laughs> I have, uh, you know, my hand pointed up is a zero, and my hand pointed down is a one. And what I can do is make a combination of the zero and one, and then now here's the thing that's really tricky. This thing is going to rotate. And now, in addition to having to keep track of was I in zero or was I in one, I have to keep track of where I was in terms of this rotation. And that makes things a lot harder, just having these two states to keep track of. So, okay, what do we want in these qubits to actually make them useful? The first is that we want them to be very long-lived. So just like when you have an external hard drive and you want the information to stay there for a really long time, uh, what I want out of my qubit is that I set its state and then when I look at it later, it is still in the same state. Then, as I said, when we make these superpositions, I also have to keep track of where it was when it was in this rotation. Um, so we also need it to be what's called coherent. So one way to think about this is if you have you know, waves traveling uh, in water, what you want is to know where you are in these peaks and troughs. And, uh, you know, eventually you sort of know this intuitively that if you did start these waves in water, they would sort of dissipate and then you wouldn't have these kind of nice little, uh, these circles if you went far enough away. So that's what I mean by coherence and decoherence. We have to keep track of where this thing is. It's rotating. Okay. And then there's a much worse problem when you actually want to do things in technology, which is that it needs to be long lived and coherent, even when we're using it. And by using it, what I mean is you can't just make like one perfect qubit that just sits in vacuum that we never talk to. At some point, if you want to make a computer or if you want to make a sensor, it's going to live, you know, in a processor or it's going to live with other qubits. We have to talk to it. We have to make these things, uh, you know, do what we want them to do. And it turns out to be very difficult to do these two things when we do this. And that's been, I would say, one of the grand challenges uh, of the last 10 or 15 years in this field. Okay, so um, I was once told by a famous professor at Harvard that a good talk is one where a third of the audience understands 100% of the talk, another third of the audience only understands two thirds, <laughs> and then the last third understands a third. <laughs> so, uh, so we're getting into the second third of the talk. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and so let me just tell you a little bit about, uh, first, let me introduce what I do living just so you understand the scope. Um, so my group works, uh, roughly on four different things. Um, so this is, uh, we work on nanoscale quantum sensing. So we try to build these very coherent quantum sensors. Uh, we also do work on technologies for quantum networks. Um, we have recently started, uh, growing and figuring out how to do the kinds of microfabrication that you do for microelectronics uh, in diamond. 
Um, and then we also work on new material systems for quantum computing. So it sort of touches all three of the technologies that I introduced at the beginning. But what I'd like to tell you about today is uh, two hopefully gentle stories about uh, this part uh, and this part. And for the physicists uh, in the audience who are here this morning for my talk, I'm sorry, this is substantially what you already saw, but you'll just have to hear uh, a repeat. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, the specific platform that we work on for quantum sensing is uh, quantum sensors that are built out of diamond. Uh, that might sound a little bit crazy. But it turns out that if I take a diamond lattice and I punch out two of the atoms and I replace one of these carbons with a nitrogen, what I get is a little defect. And that defect is colorful. Uh, and in fact, uh, people can now make kind of, this is called a nitrogen vacancy center. People can even make uh, giant, you know, several carat gemstones uh, of diamonds that are filled with these nitrogen vacancy centers. And they're this really beautiful color of pink. I think the technical term in the gemology industry is fancy pink. <laughs> so uh, the reason that this nitrogen vacancy center is very interesting to uh, quantum physicists and uh, technologists is that it turns out that um, for various reasons having to do with the unique properties of diamond, uh, these NV centers can have coherence times at room temperature that are uh, up to 10 milliseconds. And this is basically best in class. Almost nothing else room temperature lives for this long and remains coherent for this long. Um, 10 milliseconds, I guess, just for context, I, I looked this up right before this talk. You blink, that's about 100 milliseconds. So this is a tenth of the time you blink for. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to try to explain uh, how we read out this quantum sensor with light. Um, so I didn't label any of these levels, but you can just trust me that these are basically the electronic levels that are associated with the diamond. And what I'm going to do is take these three levels that are down here that I've labeled as zero, and plus and minus one, and I'm going to use these as my qubit state. Okay, so I'm just going to take two of these things, two of these levels, and pick them out, and I'm going to call one of them uh, my you know, qubit zero and one of them my qubit one. Okay, so this is this is the business end of the, the NV sensor. This is the part that matters from the quantum technologies perspective, but we have to have some way of actually talking to it, initializing it, and reading it out. And uh, it turns out that there's a really convenient way to do that in diamond. So first, if I take uh, green light, so really just something as unsophisticated as this laser pointer. I shine it on a diamond that has NV centers. And what's going to happen is that it can emit, it can relax back down into my qubit states and emit a photon. Uh, but then it turns out because of uh, the way that electrons and photons interact in the system, if I start in one of my other qubit states and I do the exact same experiment, then it can actually go by two paths where one of them is, again, emitting a photon, but the other one uh, does not emit a photon. Basically, uh, this guy is very bright, whereas this guy is dark. I now have a way, by just counting how much light I get back, just measuring the intensity of light, I can read out my qubit. And this is amazing, because it's just like a green laser pointer. <laughs> very, It's very easy. OK. So basically, what I can do is just read out my qubit by collecting the light. So, uh, so now, all that I told you was that we can read it out. I also need to turn this into some sensor. Uh, so the way that we measure magnetic fields is that it turns out that these states down here are spin states. Um, and a spin is, uh, you can sort of think of it classically as like a little bar magnet. So if I turn on a magnetic field, you know, the bar magnet can align with the magnetic field. Another way to say that is that there's some set, uh, there's some configuration of this magnet that is lower in energy, and then the opposite configuration is higher in energy. What I can do is read out kind of the difference in energies between these two different states down here in my qubit states, and then I use that to just read out the magnetic field. So I have a sensor that is really at the atomic scale, all I have to do is shine a green laser pointer at it, and I get a measurement of the magnetic field at extremely tiny length scales. So this is my nanoscale quantum sensor. Okay. Now what I need to do is uh, make good quantum sensors that have nice coherence times and operate really well. Uh, and it turns out that natural diamonds are actually not 
good enough for this. So if you pull a diamond out of the ground, uh, you know, even something that looks beautiful, that sells for immense amounts of money and, and looks really perfect to a gemologist, if I actually look at the structure and the defects in that diamond, what I will see is a boatload of stuff. And a lot of that stuff is uh, not magnetically quiet. So the NV centers do not have these long coherence times that I am advertised. Um, and this is true of like 99.9999% of diamonds that we pull out of the ground. Um, so the way that this field actually started was that there was a clever scientist in Australia who figured out that uh, there was a particular invest of diamonds from the Ural Mountains uh, that were predicted to have much better uh, a much better environment for these uh, quantum sensors. Um, and then he went and cut them into pieces, and distributed them to a bunch of physicists around the world. And that is called, and we all called them the magic Russian diamonds. <laughs> was because none of us know anything about geology, so we don't know where these things came from. Uh, this was the little piece of the magic Russian uh, that I worked on when I was a postdoc at Harvard, called her magic atlas. Um, so that's a bad basis for quantum, for technology. You don't want to wait for somebody to find a magic diamond out of the ground. Uh, and we're never going to be able to deploy these at scale. So what you would really like is a way to grow these diamonds in the lab. Um, so the problem with lab-grown diamond uh, is that diamond is very hard to grow. So uh, diamond is actually not the thermodynamically stable allotrope of carbon, the atmospheric pressure. So uh, this tagline that diamonds are forever is actually sort of, yes, um, <laughs> diamonds are a kinetically trapped state. They're a metastable state. If you, you know, kept your diamond, if you tried to keep your diamond forever, it would eventually turn into graphite. Uh, now, fortunately, the energy barrier for that to happen is like billions of years. So you don't have to worry about selling all of your diamond jewelry tomorrow. Uh, but that means that it is very hard to grow because you need to get to these extremely high pressures. Um, so diamond, uh, let's see, where does it show? Right. So uh, kind of natural diamond all exists in this range. This is 15 gigapascal. Uh, that is such a high pressure that I don't actually have a good analogy <laughs> for what that pressure is, but it only happens naturally on Earth deep inside the Earth. So diamonds all come from deep inside the Earth and then get pushed up, uh, and that's how we get them. So. All of the original attempts to grow diamond involved either making a bomb so that you could instantaneously uh, get these high pressures, uh, or uh, later on people develop these uh, these diamond these very large presses that uh, that achieve these very high pressures and high temperatures in a small area. Um, and basically, what they do is they take something really gigantic and then that you know funnels the pressure down into a very small area. So to get a big diamond, you have to have a giant press. Uh, so this is an example of you know, one of these industrial HPHD presses, and you can see that these things are larger than human size. Okay. The problem with high pressure, high temperature diamond is it looks really lousy. It's all yellow. This is also bad for quantum technologies um, because all of these, uh, the yellow stuff is a lot of nitrogen and other impurities. Uh, so, so that's not good enough either. We need something else. Uh, and it turns out uh, that people figured out, oh, 25-ish years ago, uh, how to grow extremely high purity diamond at atmospheric pressure uh, by growing it in a plasma. Um, it is a little bit magical that this works, uh, but basically what you do is you take other diamonds, stick them in the plasma, and then what you can do is grow more diamond on top of that diamond layer by layer. Um, so even though it's not thermodynamically stable, there is a way to do this uh, using plasmas. Uh, so this is a picture of one of these plasma balls. If you look down onto the chuck, you can see a bunch of diamonds that are growing in the plasma. Uh, there is now quite a few companies that sell you know, commercial gemstones, uh, including De Beers. That was the giant pink diamond that I showed at the beginning, uh, using this plasma technology. And this is now just a commercial product. So these are uh, incredibly high purity quantum grade diamonds that are grown by Element 6 at the UK. Uh, and then they can do things like intentionally dope with nitrogen to radiate to form these nitrogen vacancy centers. And that gives you this, say, fancy pink, fancy pink. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, this, from a materials perspective, this achievement is really remarkable. So 
the amount of uh, background nitrogen and boron and other impurities that remains in this diamond uh, is less than a part per billion, the B. And there are only like two or three other materials in the world that we have ever grown with these uh, impurity levels. One is silicon, because silicon is the basis of all computing, so we really had to purify it. Second is germanium, because there was a period of time where we hadn't picked silicon yet. Um, and then the third is, I always forget what it is, but it's some scintillator detector that people needed to purify for some reason. Um, so, so this is, you know, incredibly high purity, extremely low background noise for my quantum sensor. Okay, so uh, I talked a lot in abstract terms about how we talk to these NV centers uh, and then how we grow them. So let me just give you like a physical sense of how we actually do these experiments. Uh, so what we would do is take one of these diamond plates. Um, we would put them on microwave transmission lines uh, so that we can manipulate the qubit states. And then we have some microscope objective that's staring at them. And of course, inside this diamond is you know, this NV center. Uh, in real life in the lab, this is what it looks like. So the business end is this, you know, diamond sitting under my microwave, uh, my microwaves. This is a magnet and this is the microscope objective. If you zoom out, it looks messier. And if you zoom out even more, uh, there's, you know, a bunch of green laser light and a bunch of optics that steer this laser light onto my diamond. Okay, so, uh, so what I have is a sensor. I can read out the magnetic fields and it's extremely tiny. So what people would really like to do with this is now uh, uh, take advantage of the fact that this thing is so tiny, look at very tiny things. So for example, you can put these NV centers under proteins uh, and try to do magnetic resonance imaging at the single molecule or even single atom level. Uh, people have already figured out how to look at very small volumes of liquid and, uh, and various types of uh, uh, condensed matter systems, like uh, uh, sort of unique types of magnetism. Um, just to give you a sense of sort of how powerful a sensor can be, there is this beautiful result out of uh, Delft a few years ago, where they took a single NV center and then did a bunch of these magnetic resonance pulses and were able to plot the positions of uh, single carbon-13 nuclei that were all around the NV center with extreme precision. So these things were localized to within an angstrom uh, or even less. Uh, and I think it's pretty clear that if you could do something like this for uh, arbitrary things, it would be extremely powerful. You could look at whatever you wanted with this extreme precision. All right, so why haven't we ruled the world yet? So the problem is that uh, in order to look at something, at anything that isn't just stuff inside the diamond, so if I want to look at anything that's more interesting, like one of these proteins, I have to take this NV center and bring it really close to the thing that I want to look at. To bring it really close to the thing I want to look at, I also have to bring it really close to the surface. And uh, surfaces are uh, really awful. <laughs> so even though we have all of these amazing, extremely high purity diamonds, uh, you know, we can make these really, really nice uh, bulk diamonds. Once you get to the surface, at some point it has to stop being diamond and it has to turn into something else. And that's what the surface is. We're very, very bad at controlling surfaces. I would say that we're bad at controlling all surfaces, but uh, diamond surfaces are especially hard to control because diamond is the hardest material in the world. Um, I can't even polish it without just a war of attrition against other diamonds. Um, so it's, it's just very, very difficult. So what happens is you get to the surface, the surface is really messy, and now all of this engineering that I did to make a really beautiful quantum grade diamond gets completely thrown out the window because I have this horrible material at the top. So how do we know this? Uh, if I plot the coherence time, these NV centers as a function of their distance away from the surface, and I promised you, you know, 10 milliseconds, which would be up here on this plot. Instead, what I see is this horrible you know, uh, scaling where it decays really rapidly as I approach the surface. Now, when I get within nanometers, which is what you would need to do all of this nanoscale magnetic resonance imaging, uh, I'm down to, you know, less than a microsecond. I've lost many orders of magnitude uh, in this in this nice coherence. Okay, so about uh, eight, nine, ten years ago now, um, we set out to try to understand the surface noise detail. And the challenge here is that the NV center is very sensitive. But it's sort of non-selective. What the NV center tells me is um, I'm happy, or I'm sad, 
um, you know, my coherence is good, my coherence is bad, but it doesn't tell me what is actually causing all of the problems. Um, there are ways that I can look at the surface directly, uh, but um, they're very technically challenging. We don't have to talk about all of those reasons. Uh, but the, the main problem is that uh, a priori, I actually have no expectation that these surface spectroscopies are going to tell me th information that's relevant to the perspective of the qubit. The qubit is looking at some teeny tiny environment. The spectroscopy is looking at something bigger that has lower sensitivity. Um, so it might just not be telling me the right thing. So we did the dumb experimentalist approach to how to solve this problem, which was to just look at every single surface spectroscopy tool that anyone would let me near. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of user facilities and things on various campuses, and there are, are a million acronyms uh, for different ways of doing surface spectroscopy. We just tried all of them, tried all of these things, uh, and then we tried to correlate that with what we could see from the point of view of the NV Center, see if we could now try to tease apart what these different sources of noise might be. Okay, and one of the things that we discovered sort of right away was that the entire community was using, uh, you know, what they called oxygen terminated surfaces. And what they meant was, well, I took my diamond and I stuck it in an oven and then I took it out and I looked at these NV centers. What we found was that that's not actually a fine grained enough uh, characterization of the surface because I can take two diamonds and stick them in the oven and they come out with completely different uh, surfaces. And you can have different degrees of surface roughness because this oven does crazy things. And what we found was that uh, this roughness is actually a real host for this magnetic noise. OK, so uh, by using this kind of information, like roughness is bad and that leads to magnetic noise, uh, we came up with this pretty laborious approach for creating really pristine surfaces. Um, so basically, we start with uh, a special polish that leaves behind a bunch of polish damage uh, because diamond is hard to polish. Then we do some etching uh, and that leaves behind some etch damage. That leaves, then we get do a different etching that leaves behind its own damage. Then we do some thermal annealing uh, that leaves behind its own problems. And then we fix it with uh, chemical annealing at the end. So the analogy that you should think of here, um, with all respect to the symptoms, Simpsons, is that you start with a mouse problem, and then you send in the cats, and then now you send in the dogs to get rid of the cat problem, and hopefully at the end, the gorillas die in the winter. <laughs> so this is our, uh, the gorillas have died in the winter um, surface, where we have these very smooth surfaces that are um, covered in oxygen and are very magnetically quiet. Great. The data gets a little bit more abstract. But let me just give you a flavor. So we can look at the NV center and characterize the noise. And we see that there's this magnetic noise. We can also do this X-ray spectroscopy and the X-rays see a lot of disorder at the surface. Um, so we can sort of correlate these two different things and then figure out how to improve them. At the end of this whole thing, that we were able to improve the coherence time of NV centers about an order of magnitude. It was about a factor of 10. So we're now just using uh, these very coherent uh, quantum sensors for a whole bunch of things in my lab. Uh, we're trying to do physics. We're trying to look at these proteins. Uh, we're trying to study other material systems. Um, so it's been a very enabling tool for a lot of other types of science. Okay, so now I'm going to completely change gears, talk about a totally different system, um, basically informed by the type of work that we did to improve NV centers. Uh, this will be a shorter story. Apologize again to the physicists that you're hearing this for the second time today. Or I will offend exactly the same number of people. Um, so uh, superconducting qubits are another one of these qubits uh, that has been extremely successful uh, for quantum computing. So if you've read anything in the press about uh, quantum processors, you've probably heard that IBM has a, a giant quantum computing effort. Google has a giant quantum computing effort. Uh, there are several startup companies uh, like Rigetti uh, that are all working on um, this technology. So this is an example of a chip from Google. Um, and uh, superconducting qubits uh, have now been integrated into some of the largest quantum processors that anyone has built, um, You know, up to hundreds of qubits. I mean, this is a really ama amazing achievement. Uh, for the experts in the room, the thing that I find most exciting about this is that people are now finally starting to do a so-called quantum error correction experiments, which all of us thought were science fiction just a decade ago. Um, okay, 
All of this achievement hides uh, sort of an uncomfortable fact about superconducting qubits, uh, which is that um, this is called Minkoff's law in analogy to Moore's law. What you can do is sort of plot the improvement in this lifetime of qubits over time. So this axis is years. And at the beginning, there was this immense kind of trajectory where people were making these improvements to superconducting qubits where they got all the way from nanoseconds to about 100 microseconds. And then around 2011, 2012, uh, there was just no more progress, completely stagnated for almost a decade. Um, so even though we were able to do these amazing things, there was this kind of weird problem where nobody had been able to improve qubits uh, for a very long time despite a lot of effort. So uh, we know a few things about this. Uh, so one is that uh, we believe that the losses are related to surfaces. Um, so what we can see is that, again, this is lifetime, and this is essentially the size of the device. So as you make the devices bigger, they get better. Um, so what we can now do is look at these qubits and try to figure out, all right, let's get all of our surfaces. Where do we think the loss might be coming from uh, if I stare at every surface in this device? So uh, I got third sniped into this problem, I guess, three or four years ago now, uh, and started working with uh, Andrew Hauck, uh, who is a colleague at Princeton, who is uh, you know, one of the people who was responsible for inventing the transmon when he was a postdoc, um, and the, which is the superconducting qubit we're working on, um, and Bob Kava, uh, who is a, a solid state chemist, so he really grows uh, you know, bulk crystals, we looked at Andrew's qubits and we said, okay, where do we think the problems on the surfaces are? And we immediately came up with two different hypotheses for where the surface loss might come from uh, based on this material system. The first was very simple, which is just that uh, everything's covered in junk. You know, it's very hard to clean uh, junk off of all surfaces, even if you try to do a really, really good job. Like if you take a surface and you throw it in acid and you know, do all of this stuff, the second that you pull it out into air, covered in junk again. Um, so, uh, so my very naive quantitative argument was, well, I can look up the microwave losses associated with stuff and most stuff, uh, has a microwave loss that's essentially consistent with what you're seeing, uh, on, on all of these qubits. So maybe that's it. Um, the other thing that Bob pointed out was that, uh, Andrew's group was using niobium. Niobium has extremely complicated surfaces, uh, that are really hard to control and are totally different if you just look at them funny. He said, that's bad. You want something that's much more resilient. So uh, we figured out how to clean substrates. Um, and we switched away from niobium to something that we could clean. We, what we basically did was we just went one down on the periodic table, to a metal called tantalum. The key fact about tantalum is that uh, it has very nice oxides, so they aren't all funky when you do things to it. Uh, but importantly, they are extremely resilient. You can do things like take a film of tantalum, stick it in boiling, oxidizing acids for hours and hours, and it just doesn't, doesn't blink, doesn't say boo. Um, and what we can see is that it really does have this really robust oxide. It doesn't change at all, almost no matter what we do to it. Okay, the end result of all of this is that uh, by switching to tantalum, you are able to get to lifetimes of around uh, 300 microseconds right away, which is a factor of three improvement over the state of the art that had stood for about a decade. Um, so just by trying one different material and doing a really careful job of cleaning it, you're able to push the state of the art by a bit. So since our work, lots of groups have reproduced it and even improved on it uh, to get up to a millisecond. Um, and this has now been integrated into some pretty sophisticated experiments. Okay, so uh, just to conclude this little section, um, I think the key takeaway is that we had a really big leap in performance with just a very simple material change and some attention to detail about the surfaces. Um, generously, superconducting qubit community had explored maybe five superconducting metals or something before our work. We just tried one more and were able to, you know, leap ahead by a factor of three. So I can write down another like 20 metals that you can easily deposit superconduct at reasonable temperatures, it's probably time for a broad material search. I think it's time to try some things. Okay. So this is uh, this is partly for everyone and partly for the scientists in the room. And I thought I would share three or four lessons learned from um, this exploration across these two platforms. 
Um, so the first lesson I think that's important uh, is that appropriately measuring and parameterizing your problem is extremely important. Uh, so there's this story that when people started studying electricity and magnetism in the 19th century, it was horrible because the only way that you could reproduce what happened in, say, Michael Faraday's lab was to have his exact rig and, and just build everything to the exact specifications of what he did. And then you could reproduce his data. Um, so it wasn't until people defined standards, right, and defined what the ohm was and the farad that you were able to just parameterize problems, and compare apples to apples across different labs. So I would argue that the qubit world has had a similar problem over the last 25 years, where the only way that you can reproduce someone else's qubit is to have their exact package, their exact fridge, their exact wiring, their exact filtering, and only then can I get the exact same result. The terrible basis trying to discover anything else. The important thing is that once you make a plot, for example, in NV world, it was not possible to just compare these surfaces by saying my qubits are better than yours. What you really needed to do was make this plot of coherence versus depth. And once you had coherence versus depth, then no matter what anyone else did in their lab, they had to do the exact same measurement. And then they could make their plot against my plot and then say, have you done better or have you done worse? So I think advances are only possible when we can actually compare apples to apples. What we've learned from this is that everything is covered in junk, no matter what you do, but not all junk is created equals. So the key thing is to try to find a way to get mitigatable. Okay, lesson two. Uh, in general, you might be looking in the wrong place for our problems. Uh, Physicists are very enamored with the tools that they build and the specific measurements that they can do. Uh, everyone had to suffer through the story this morning as well. Um, but in NV land, if you had asked anyone 10 years ago, what is the problem with diamond surfaces? What they would have said is, ah, I know exactly what it is. I can do this specific measurement and I can look at these spins. Um, and what they saw was that this rate coupling to these spins correlated really well with T2. This looks like a smoking gun. Like I found my problem. This is my magnetic noise. And, and really, if you had asked anyone in the community 10 years ago, they would have said, this is it. What we found uh, was that actually this is a spurious correlation. So it is true. These surface spins correlate with T2, but both of them correlate with depth. What you were seeing was that uh, they just looked like they correlated. We could find surface conditions where we could improve one and not the other. These, the, these were actually not the main culprit. Um, so the analogy here is like, uh, you know, there's some parable about a drunk guy in the parking lot looking under the lamppost for his keys. And someone comes out and says, you know, this where you think you lost your keys. And he says, no, this is just the only place where there's any light to look. Okay, lesson three, and this is a little bit more in the weeds, um, but, uh, in some ways, a lot of the ways that people were trying to do this, uh, you know, building better qubits project was by just looking at their qubit. And that is an incredibly slow way to progress because it's really hard to look at your qubit. The measurements are really expensive. They take a lot of time. They're very laborious. Um, so what's really important uh, is that you find some proxy uh, so that you don't have to always measure your qubit. And then maybe you actually learn what's wrong with your system and then you can address it directly rather than just doing uh, the, the slow thing. Okay, lesson four. Um, a lot of problems in this space are a lot more like murder mysteries than you would expect. I think when people think of like uh, how you solve a murder, what you would hope to find is some blockbuster forensic evidence. Like I just have a blood sample and now I have DNA and then I go match it to some database and I find the dude's cousin and then, you know, that's it. <laughs> but most murder mysteries are not actually solved like that. Most murder mysteries are solved with this old fashioned detective work where you have a lot of like weird circumstantial evidence and maybe you don't have the blockbuster forensic evidence, but you figure out like who was here and who actually wanted this person dead and, you know, all of that stuff. And I think this qubit stuff is very similar where there's this temptation us to want to find the blockbuster evidence, but the truth is there's many things that are contributing. And you sort of have to live in this uncomfortable world where you had a lot, have a lot of circumstantial evidence that you have to put together. Um, let me just end with something that's not on a slide. But as I was 
talking through this talk with my husband as we were on a hike this afternoon, he came up with a much better analogy for this building a better Cuba thing. So I will just share it with you. Uh, so I think a lot of people in the quantum technology field would like to say that, uh, you know, figuring out what's wrong with qubits is a lot like doing medical diagnosis. You know, I'm going to go and figure out why you have this cough, why you have this fever. And then, you know, we give you the right medicine and then we've just fixed the problem. The truth is that building a qubit with a very long coherence time is more like asking, how do we make people live for 500 years? Right? The answer is not going to be one thing. <laughs> You're not going to say, if we just solve this one thing, I can have a person that lives for 500 years. You might have one thing extends life to 100 years and then and then that just unveils a different problem so then now i have to do a different thing to get it get that person to live for 150 years and then a totally different thing to get them to, get, to go to 200 years these qubits are really this this war with all of these sources of noise or once you peel back one layer you find the next thing that's limiting you and you have to keep on improving over and over again okay so with that let me just acknowledge uh, you know, science, especially experimental science, well done with uh, teams of amazing students uh, and collaborators. Uh, so the NV story that I told you was uh, largely led by P. Sartweisen, and then sort of the new folks in the group that are leading uh, the NV Center Improvement Project are Jared Rovney and Kai Hun Cheng. Uh, all of the qubit work that I talked about was in collaboration, very close collaboration with Andrew Houck and Bob Kava, who are both uh, colleagues at Princeton, and we have a fairly large team that's working on trying to come up with the next generation of superconducting qubits. With that, I will thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Do I do a sir? Okay. Um, you. <laughs> It would help us to leave 150 years. I, I, I think I didn't quite hear. Uh, if any increase in your hero style of curious, will it help us to leave 150 years? Oh, I see. Okay, the question was, if I if I fix the cubic coherence thing, will it help anyone to live 150 years? I think this is the part of the evening where I get into a lot of trouble. <laughs> uh, so, okay. The only thing that we know for sure, with mathematical certainty, that quantum computers can do really well is this thing that I talked about at the beginning, which is factoring large numbers. We don't really see how that's going to help us live 150 years, uh, but there are a lot of other very smart people who think that you can do, for example, a better quantum chemistry with quantum computers. In that case, you could use a quantum computer to do drug discovery, for example. Um, but I would call that stuff, looking at Ken to see if he agrees with this, a little bit more speculative. <laughs> I, I'm not going to, you know, bet my right arm that that argument is correct, uh, but I think it is worth trying. Yeah. So my, my entire knowledge of this field is this talk, but um, could you... Could you... I, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> um, could you try an approach where you keep the NV centers further from the surface uh, but have a lot more of them and probe them all and try and use, like, try and combine a bunch of results from these different NV centers and try and cancel out my statistically to get a better result. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, uh, can we just, you know, move the NV centers farther away uh, and then just use a bunch of them? Um, that is an excellent question. And I, th I would say that it really depends on what it is that you're trying to do. So for uh, the specific application that I talked about, which is, you know, let's take like a protein or something and put it on the surface, what you really need is spatial resolution. So, um, you know, in rough terms, my spatial resolution is going to depend on the distance from this thing. There's no, there's no way around getting just like really close. If all that you care about is like a good magnetic sensor, um, and there's lots of reasons that people want better magnetic sensors, uh, I'll just give you one quick example, which is that... Um, uh, one thing that I've learned is that apparently if uh, if we shoot down the GPS satellites, you know, like if we go to war with someone and everyone shoots down GPS satellites, you have no backup technology. <laughs> backup technology is essentially World War II era technology. Uh, so one thing that you would like is a magnetometer that sits on your plane and then allows you to correct for the long-term drift of gyroscopes by measuring the Earth's magnetic field. There's a lot of interest in making extremely sensitive magnetometers. The right way to do that is really to just load up 
Diamond with NV centers and measure all of them at once, and then do some of these statistical tricks, right, um, to to figure out you know what exactly you're looking at. Hey, that's good. Um, are all the diamonds that you're using the the same size and shape? But if so, how large are they? Yeah, it, it's a it's a good question. So you don't have to be the same size and shape, but like I mentioned, uh, the people who grow this quantum grade diamond, it's all coming from essentially one company. Uh, element six, and they ship them as these uh, plates. So um, the typical sample that we work with is, you know, um, about the width of your thumb and uh, and very, very thin. Uh, so they are not things that you can turn into gemstones by design because element six is owned by De Beers. So they don't want anyone uh, making random, random gemstones. Uh, but like I also mentioned, De Beers is now selling essentially the same quality of diamond in these, in these giant things, actually. Might embarrassingly have one around my neck right now, <laughs> but uh, but so so you can now actually get you know kind of macroscopically large, uh, essentially quantum grade diamond uh, just by going onto like a website or something. Is Element Six aware of the surface issues from their products, or or are they able to engineer or create like a surface in a vacuum or under a liquid that could be thin instead of being exposed to oxygen? Yeah, the, the question is like, do the industry people know about these surfaces? Yeah, I so I collaborate with them very extensively. They know about all the stuff that I'm doing <laughs> quite a bit. And actually, the polish that we start with is essentially, it was, it was originally developed by someone from the Naval Research Lab, but then refined uh, at Element 6. So they, you know, they work really hard on surfaces. They have a lot of technological applications that they're interested in. And it's just a very hard problem, and it's it's not that easy to, you know, solve with the you know, with the snap of your fingers. Back. The scalability of this technology, of the intentions of making it, you know, cheaper or mass production, or is it still just looking at the computer? Do you mean the, the diamond uh, technology or the, uh, the question was whether or not the, the diamond technology is scalable. Um, uh, so I guess, like I mentioned, uh, these diamonds are now a commercially available product. Uh, you can buy them. You can even buy these pink diamonds that have all these NV centers in them. Um, so I don't think that cost is actually going to be a really big problem. Um, I think right now we're still in the fundamental technology development stage where people have made uh, a lot of promising prototypes and you know have shown that things are really useful for science. But then kind of, um, as many of us know, making that leap into a technology that actually is mass produced and reliable and, you know, you can actually use in the field all the time without any problems is, is a whole other, a whole other ball game. But I, from what I, I'm not an expert in like the economics of this, but what I can see, I don't think that the cost of the material is going to be the showstopper. What are the energy requirements to make the diamonds? Uh, uh, he asked, what are the energy requirements to make the diamond? That is the uh, trillion dollar question. <laughs> you actually asked a very, very good question. Um, oof, what am I allowed to say? <laughs> um, I, I've, I've started growing diamond myself and I have all these NDAs with the element six and stuff. Um, so that that is the main cost, I guess, is what I can say. Di diamond is just carbon. The feedstock is extremely cheap, right? Usually you literally take methane, hydrogen and you put them in this plasma almost all of your cost is in uh running the plasma which is very very power hungry um the rest of the cost is in things like polishing is still very intensive and people haven't figured out how to automate that in a good way um but yes it is it is 100 percent energy i guess i can share one fact that is publicly uh, publicly known and available which is that when de beers made their uh commercial you know we're going to sell these gemstones um thing they made that site in Oregon because they had access to extremely cheap electricity, Oregon. So it's enough of a factor that it completely affected where they were going to locate their manufacturing plant. How long does it actually take you to prepare the surface of all those steps that you have to go Oh my gosh. <laughs> the question is how long does it take us to prepare the surface? You know, I have this uh, this colleague. It's been like really fun to work with him because he comes from like uh, semiconductor processing manufacturing land, and um, and he wanted to know like, can we do a 
a different, more semiconductor manufacturing type process to do to replace the surface thing. So he made my student give a whole group meeting talk. And then we got to the end of it and he was like, you know, it's very impressive, but this is the worst thing I've ever <laughs> so, um So it's extremely laborious. Uh, I think, okay, if I add it up, let's say if you were sprinting and you really wanted to do it all at once, you could do it in something like a week, maybe two. <laughs> And then, and that's assuming that your yield is 100%. And of course, a lot of our problems are that step kind of fails and you have to figure out how to backtrack and stuff like that. So I think our actual, if if you measured, I've never done this exercise. I think it would be upsetting if I did this exercise. If you, I bet if you measured kind of mean, uh, we get the diamond from element six up until we have these nice NV centers in them time, probably something like six months. Uh, from a practical perspective, what can what real world uh, impact do current qubits have? And if you improve them by tenfold, what would that mean for mankind? Yeah, that's a very good question. So the question is, do current qubits have uh, any practical impact? And then if we improve them by tenfold, then what would their impact on mankind? Um, so I think the nearest term uh, application is really these sensors. And there are already those bulk diamond sensors that are deployed in the field as actual products. Uh, so Lockheed Martin had a project doing this GPS nine navigation thing. Uh, they stuck a magnetometer on a plane. And so I, I don't know exactly what the status of that project is, but they got all the way to making a widget that they could stick on a thing. And, uh, and I know that there are other projects that are putting these things on satellites and things like that. I think the sensing part uh, we're already doing now. Um, if you could get, so another tenfold improvement on coherence, it really depends on what application you're talking about. Um, if I turn to quantum computing, for example, uh, there's, um, okay, how much do I want to get into this? So, okay, yeah, let's let's try it. Uh, so so uh, in your computer, there can be errors. Right, like you can think that a bit was supposed to be a zero, but then you go back and measure it, and it flipped into a one, and that was a problem. So the way that we handle this in classical computers is that there are all of these so-called error correction schemes. For example, in, instead of encoding your information in just a single bit, you can just code it in three bits, uh, and then take a majority vote. That if only one of them flips, you can ask the other two, "What do you guys say?" Um, in quantum mechanics, this is super hard. Because in quantum computing, you know, quantum mechanics kind of doesn't allow you to copy things, uh, and uh, and it makes all of this error correction really weird in uh, in quantum computers. But there are schemes that exist for doing this error correction. The problem is because they're so weird, involve a lot of operations. When people have tried to do this in the past, after you've done all of these operations to do your error correction, you're worse off when you started. So you would have been better off just keeping your, your one bit to begin with and letting it kind of die over time and trying to do all of this crazy stuff to, to keep it alive. So there's this big kind of goal, which is get your qubits live long enough that when you do all of these operations, you don't lose from doing the operations. I think the first near-term thing that we get, we can improve things by about a factor of 10, is that we can now do this error correction. So now that's a far, far cry from impact on mankind. <laughs> but uh, I think once we can start doing this uh, error correction, we're in a completely different era in terms of quantum computing uh, because our current processors, um, you know, they can do physics experiments. They can't really do anything that's useful. Um, and I think once once we get into this era where we're actually doing error correction, we can start to think about building useful computers. <laughs>